TV ratings were huge for the four-day battle for House Speaker that resulted in Kevin McCarthy's election. Part of the attraction was the unfettered access given to C-SPAN cameras to televise the proceedings and provide its feed to outlets, including CNN. Last week, I argued here that the American people deserve continued unfiltered access to the House chamber. But as soon as Kevin McCarthy actually took the gavel, back went the camera to its standard fixed position aimed at the lectern. Those rules are set by the party that controls the House, except for special events like the election of a House Speaker. Well, Tuesday, the co-CEO of C-SPAN sent a letter to McCarthy seeking permission to operate its own independent cameras in the chamber, citing the positive public reaction and the transparency themes in McCarthy's own rules package. Among the congressmen who have voiced their agreement, my next guest, Matt Gates. You'll remember during the speaker battle, the camera captured Gates having private conversations with a frustrated McCarthy, chatting with Democrats, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We even saw as he was almost physically attacked by fellow Congressman Mike Rogers, who later apologized. So much lies ahead for the 118th Congress. I want these cameras to show it all be it the looming debt limit standoff, the debates over investigations of the FBI and Hunter Biden, the battles over China and the origin of COVID-19, the blame game of the never-ending border crisis. Florida Congressman Matt Gates joins me now. Congressman, thank you for coming back. Without C-SPAN, it occurs to me that without C-SPAN cameras, we would not have seen you nearly attacked by Mike Rogers. Do you think that incident is an example of why some of your colleagues, they don't want full camera access? No, I think that the reason people have opposed our effort to democratize viewing of the House floors because in many of the debates, no one's present and they want to maintain the fiction that that's actual legislating. And whenever there's sharp disagreement or discord or fiery debate on the floor or in committee, the camera always catches those moments. But there are also moments of great interpersonal warmth and collaboration and the forming of alliances that you might not normally see, whether it's myself talking to Ilhan Omar about war powers or Pramila Jayapal about big tech regulation or discussing floor strategy with AOC. I think the American people would be able to humanize Congress more if they saw more of our human interactions and not just the theater that's on display during much of the debate. With regard to Rogers and the incident, which I'm showing now in slow-mo, what went on from your perspective? How, how much did you see of him coming at you? Well, Mike Rogers and I have worked together for six years on some of the most tense national security issues on the Armed Services Committee. So it's not the first time we've been frustrated with one another or worked together. Matter of fact, that wasn't a remarkably unique incident. There are times when the pressure cooker is on when we do yell and get heated, and that's okay among colleagues. What was different about this was just that it was caught on camera. So, you know, Mike and I are fine. We've worked together before. We will again in the future. Uh, but if we have had more dynamic camera angles, then I think you'd see these flare-ups and then the backslapping afterwards and the agreement, and the American people could see alliances form and dissolve in real time rather than just getting a more curated rendition of what happens. As much as I want those cameras, the camera work in that instance was a little shoddy because it followed Kevin McCarthy back into the well of the house and we never saw you. Did you get on your feet? Did you get ready for blows? I mean, how close did it come? Oh, no, I, I think that it was overblown a bit. I mean, Mike was expressing his frustration with me, and I totally understand different people had different perspectives in that moment. Uh, and, you know, the, the argument against these cameras was actually made on your network by Paul Ryan this last week when he said, well, we already have enough performance in Congress. We don't want people playing to the cameras in these moments. Uh, I think that the public value of being able to see the human in interactions in frustration, in warmth, in all of those things far outweighs the risk that people will play to the cameras. I mean, we, we have that during debate one way or the other. I, I think some of the old guard in Congress opposes this because they want to continue to maintain the fiction that when four or five people are on the floor spending millions of dollars, uh, that that is actually the action of the whole legislative body when the reality is far different. And if we had cameras on the floor, my suspicion is we would have far better attendance during the debates that impact the lives of our fellow Americans.
Every Saturday, I have a poll question, as I think you know during the course of the program. Last Saturday, we set a record. More than 46,000 people voted on this issue, and it could not have been more decisive. Put up the result of that. I think it was 90 percent uh, of people who said, yeah, 93.91 percent, they want the camera access. Today, Congressman, the Washington Post lead editorial is on this issue and agrees with your perspective. Quick final question on this. What's the likelihood that you can sway Kevin McCarthy? Well, I'm encouraged that there's actually a lot of bipartisan support for this measure. Uh, some Democrats have put forth their own proposal. And so I hope that if we got 218 people to agree, whether they were Republicans or Democrats, that Speaker McCarthy would, uh, would be very persuaded by that. And so we're working right now to build that bipartisan coalition to go to the Speaker. And it is in line with a lot of the goals the Speaker laid out in the Rules Committee to have more transparency, to have more open votes, to have more open rules. So if we're gonna have open votes and open rules, Let's have an open chamber for all the American people to observe. On another matter that pertains to video, you, you apparently were able to earn a concession from him that all of the security video from Capitol Hill on January 6th is going to enter the public domain. First of all, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that was something that you were able to get him to agree to. Secondly, what is it you want to see? What do you expect to see in that video? Well, I think that you likely will see a lot of exculpatory evidence where people may have been in some sort of technical violation of federal criminal law, but never intended to harm anyone and never intended to breach any type of security uh, barrier. A lot of those barriers may have been taken down. I'm a believer that transparency answers a lot of questions and whether there's higher criminal acuity for some, lower criminal acuity for others, releasing that video will be important. Also, we already know from whistleblower interviews we've done that there were federal assets and agents that were on the ground that day to be able to observe their conduct, their potential coordination with one another would be of great interest to many of us on the Judiciary Committee and I think many people throughout the country. So prosecutors have said, and I'm thinking in the context of the case of Eric Torrens, he from Tennessee, it shouldn't be released because it's going to jeopardize security, that too much will enter the public domain about the nooks and crannies, my words, not theirs, of the Capitol. Are you worried that you're going to jeopardize the security of yourself and your colleagues if all of this video comes into the public space? No, almost every inch of the Capitol is subject to video surveillance. If you don't believe that, go into any casino in America and you see the extent to which the zooms and pans and tilts uh, inform on how people see these things. So if the security of members of Congress is dependent on shielding the perspectives of these cameras, then it's not a very good security regime. I think that's a red herring, and I think it's, a, it's an argument made by the Department of Justice because they don't want to expose the extent to which there might have been and federal assets or agents enhancing criminal acuity. We don't know that. That's why we want to see the footage. But I think we'll all be safe and sound even following the release of that information. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said that on, I think, Thursday, we're going to hit the debt ceiling limit of $31 trillion. Are we headed for a standoff where you and your colleagues are demanding of cuts, including Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid? Uh, we did include in our negotiations a reversion to 2022 spending levels. That would require changes in some of the mandatory spending, which, of course, is driven by Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. I think work requirements are something we could get a lot of bipartisan agreement on, particularly in states that had Medicaid expansion under Obamacare. But remember, just as I teamed up with Democrats for the floor action last week, you also may see some Republicans in the middle team up with Democrats to discharge a clean debt limit, there's something called a discharge petition where if you get 218 signatures on something, it comes right to the floor. So uh, some of my conservative colleagues and I may be disappointed if you see moderate Republicans working with Democrats to get a clean vote on the debt limit. We would probably like to use that as an opportunity to analyze some of the mandatory spending that's given us a $32 trillion debt. You know that economists say if we get close to default, then what's going to happen? Interest rates are going to rise. People are going to feel it in their mortgages, in their auto loans, in their credit card bills. 
Yeah, that's why we need to start now. We should not engage in brinksmanship. We're already having the discussions with uh, Jody Arrington, the new chairman of the Budget Committee, about how to create a budget resolution to inform on policy choices. We have an obligation as the Republicans in the majority to sell to the American people work requirements or other spending reductions to get buy-in on that. I don't believe we should push this to the very end. I think we need to be laying out a plan now to get our fiscal house in order. But as you know, Michael, with interest rates rising, that changes the debt service obligations of the country. And it's one of the major drivers of our spending now is servicing that debt. So we have to be able to get it under control. And the math is undeniable that as more baby boomers continue to utilize more of the programs that drive mandatory spending, uh, we are going to have that take a greater and greater share of the federal budget.